I've personally been a trader for five years now, but even though I would say I reached a good level of profitability, I never stop studying and learning because financial markets are so big and there's so many different ways to approach it. So I decided to keep stealing what I can and what can be useful for my approach from the best traders in the world like Jan Smolin, Stefano Serafini or Patrick Nil. I have been studying and collaborating with Patrick Nil over the last year and became great friends with him and Jonathan Gebers, which is the guest of today's podcast. And Jonathan is in his early 20s trading side by side with Patrick Nil on his trading floor. And he started probably from the same place where you are right now, searching and watching trading videos on YouTube to now becoming a full-fledged professional and learn so many valuable things in the meantime that we're sharing with you in this interview. So enjoy. Ciao. So in the previous videos, we've seen uh, Patrick Neil and Jonathan explain how explain us a little bit about their story and their team and how they work and how they trade. Um, so today I wanted to have a little deep dive uh, with Jonathan since it was much appreciated. And let's talk a little bit about uh, some things um, not only related to the uh, your role in the team, uh, but also about your personal uh, journey as a trader as a whole and about the trading space. Because I would love to hear your, your opinion on many topics. I love, like we, we had the chance to talk uh, often about a uh, different topic and I think uh, we can give some values or some cool insights to the traders. So welcome to the podcast again. So, Thanks for inviting us to uh, Prague. Yes. To a dark basement somewhere in Prague 2024. Uh, yes. <laughs> we we started with the dark concept. I'm not sure if it's yes. still working, but we will see. We'll see we we asked before the podcast if the background's going to be be white or black because otherwise I would have a dark shirt again. I will be same color than yes. the background. So Yes, for today you're very contrast. Improvement from podcast to podcast. Definitely. So ne next one is going to be even better. 1% um, better every day. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like with trading. Um, so... I would like to start with uh, your journey as a trader. Where uh, where did it start? Uh, how old were you? Uh, and yeah, what was your journey until joining Patrick's team and uh, all the all the team? Yes. So my journey with trading began like my first contact to stocks or stock exchanges in general was in school, maybe fifth or sixth grade in Germany. There were like some small simulated games where like banks go to schools and say like we make a simulation. And the best team's gonna win something. Ah, so it's the same right. stuff Patrick started in the year 2000. For me, it was yeah. 10, 15 years later. <laughs> but it still was cool, but it was like just like the first contact. I didn't take it for serious. It was just maybe so a little bit fun. Can, can you clarify? So banks would come to the school? Yeah, you have like local banks where yeah. your grandma is or your family is, and you have yeah. like daily bank account. And they make like simulation games where they give you an account, and then you have most of the time small, small, small teams. You. You re register with your, your friends or to just you by yourself. And you kind of trade? And you kind of trade. You buy stocks wow. and they're simulated, but still the winner gets something. All right. That is, that is so weird. Like, and not weird, but like I, I can understand the good faith of it, but it's like raising a new generation of gamblers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but it also was there in the year 2000. So Patrick, I think it was Patrick's first contact to, to StockX. Really, yeah, was it? Was well. Wow. So that was my first contact. But as I said, I was not taking it serious. And my parents are not into investing in finance at all. Mm -hmm. My dad is an engineer. So he's just like developing his stuff. Mm -hmm. And my mom is a teacher. So yeah. and there's Swabian. And Swabian is like a, a ethical group in southern Germany. I think nobody in Germany likes it. It's like the Bavarians. Is they're like very... It's an they're, actual they're special <laughs> yeah so I mean, they're special so it's an actual ethnicity yeah, in germany yeah it's like big one big one in the south we have a dialect that nobody likes that's different to understand and we also have a mentality or ment philosophy yeah, yeah mindset where or mindset where there's a saying that you need to save 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 and then build a house but it's only about saving and working and not investing it's all right so about saving so honest work then you save it and then you build a house. So pure rat race. So the, the German one is like, yeah, schaffe, schaffe, Häusle bauen. It's like work, 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 and then build a house. Right. And how, so how did you get, up from that mind, get out from that mindset? Um, Except with basic education. I was lazy my whole life, All right. basically. So <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I was just lazy. I always, was always looking for an efficient way to go somewhere. And in 2016, when I finished my middle school, like in Germany, there's lower school, middle school, high school. I graduated from middle school and then the decision was like continuing school on the high school or find a job, get like education mm -hmm. somewhere and get a real job. And I was like, nah, working, mm -hmm. not not for me. And then we continued or I, I decided to continue for school. And then thankfully my dad had or my parents had the idea to go 
to another country and I was like yeah I'm interested in going to another country as well because I was like I think I was a difficult child when I was like 14 15 16 so thanks to my parents until today <laughs> that I'm here now um and they wanted to go to another country I was like yeah I would go there as well because I had some friends in Germany but everything was difficult and I uh, me and in the school we were weren't bet- best friends mm-hmm. although I was average um but then we went to China for three years mm-hmm. so then we were living with the whole family in Shanghai for some years and in 2016 that was my first year and then I got my pocket money not in in, in euros I got it in Chinese yuan huh. and then it was different every month and then I realized hmm, how can I optimize my pocket money maybe it's more in the beginning of the month middle of the month end of the month stuff like this so this was my first realization that there for example is like currency cha- exchange yeah and the rate is different and varying and so on and that way i just did some research i tried to optimize this because i didn't want to work i mean i did some small work but not a lot of work and mm-hmm. as a student or as a going to school you want to have more money definitely because you want to go out with your friends to party yeah, of course and with more money it's more fun most of the times so then I tried to optimize this, then I did some research, and then I found cryptocurrencies. Then I was in a rabbit hole. It never left me. So I just did more research and more research, and then I started trading. Then I crashed my first trading account when I was 17, I think, on Coinbase Pro day trading Bitcoin with fees of 0.25% per trade, I think it was back then. Mm-hmm. So yeah, day trading with uh, commissions of 0.25% is impossible. <laughs> So yeah. that was that was the start. And then I finished my school. I started studying in South Germany. And then I realized that there, like I made some money in the crypto markets. And then I realized, okay, there's more than just crypto markets. Yep. Obviously, Forex markets, stocks, bonds, and so on. And then I did research about that. And then I realized that there's a trading competition. I was like, I had a look at everything that was on the internet i read everything and then i had like a word document putting screenshots and my comments and notes in there it was like i think 70 or 80 pages but compromise like i'm really good at compromising just the necessary stuff and i you tried to do it summarizing yeah summarizing the yeah. the necessary stuff and then there was the world trading championship there was somebody like Raul Glavan, some names i followed but nobody was as long there as patrick nil and then i researched patrick nil i was studying um, international economics and then the COVID stuff came and I was studying and trading for myself. And it's lonely because if you have nobody to talk about on a higher level about economics and all or trading in general, it's very lonely because I sat there during COVID studying on your desk, trading on your desk. It was like, where's yeah. the social aspect and where's somebody to have a conversation on a higher level? And then I did some research on Patrick Nill and then I found like a website that looked like from 1980 and there was a phone number. And then I just called that phone number because I did it several times before when I tried to reach out to a mentor. Mm -hmm. And then I was talking to the mentor of Patrick. And then I had like 15, 20 minutes talk on the phone with him. And then he invited me for a coffee into the office because we realized that it's very close. Mm -hmm. And then he invited me and then it was like small dream coming true because six guys sitting in front of a lot of screens yeah markets open everywhere. And it was like, oh, it's like like a small trading floor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, And I was there for three or four hours first i was dropping off in the wrong location so i needed to to sprint i think three or four oh, kilometers right. to the you, office you told us that. yeah and they offered yeah. me to pick me up i was like nah i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna go there the it was like summer 30 degrees um yeah that was there and then they invited me or said i can come there more often but i was mm-hmm. feeling uncomfortable because i was 20 yeah 19 no i was 20 back then and they were like 30 plus 40 plus mm-hmm. yeah and then at some point, I just went there sometimes. So maybe once a week, I just sat on the table, on the lunch table. Yeah. And I studied and I traded mm. and I listened to everything they talked. Like in the team, there's a lot of communication in the office because I was thankful to have the possibility to listen to them, people that are looking at the markets for years. Yeah. And then one day, like I always said them, I'm going to do everything how I can support you and I'm thankful if I can learn from you yeah and that way like a relationship established the first four months Patrick didn't even realize me he he was like oh who's this weird guy sitting on the table over there but uh someday they just came up to me and were like Jonathan we still have a free table here don't you want to sit here like regularly every day 
and mm -hmm. want to get a, a member of the team. I was like, yeah, why not? And then I went there more frequently and then we had some projects together and I tried to support them and everything where I can support them, creating presentations, for example, holding presentations, yeah. stru structuring stuff internally, also processes like how do you connect an analysis to a trader because sometimes it's different somebody's analyzing something but somebody else is trading it yeah so you need to combine that and make a system for that stuff like this yeah and even nowadays stuff like podcasts bringing patrick to podcasts or <laughs> to the world out there and asking yep. questions or teaching you guys stuff yeah. like this so doing yeah. everything i can trading for myself and yeah growing with the team nice so how has your chain also your trading evolved uh from you know since you were just self-teaching or just founding stuff online to applying their strategies and their edges so the learning process before i found the team was it was there but it was intense because it was just i tried to combine a lot of different stuff um it worked but it was intense because it's, for me if i look back it's an overload it was mm -hmm. just an overload of information and i was not able or did, i did not have the skill to differentiate what information is valid or important and what is not and what is good to combine and what not and when i decided or got the possibility or the offer to learn from those guys i was like okay i did it everything i knew before or i've done before with the market structure london session currency stuff fundamentals and all that stuff deleted everything and said like i'm like a new blank sheet and i'm gonna write down all the stuff those guys teach me and I'm going to implement and like really deeply study what those guys are doing or the team. And then I did this for one and a half years, I think. So, for example, internally, we, we create very often business zones. Yeah. One guy of our team is creating the business zones every morning. So the easiest step is just to take them, import them into your software. Yeah. And they're there. But that way you're not learning something. So in the beginning, I always was doing all the analysis by myself maybe 30 40 minutes every morning the more often you do it the faster you get yeah and then import his file and then check where are the differences mm -hmm. yeah and it doesn't mean that just because he has more market experience he's always right it's a different view of the market and but only that way by doing this yourself studying and getting experience you get like experience and that way you can adapt the trade and when i was like okay the zones are getting really close or i understand the context and how the zones are created and you're gonna you start to see things in the market then i started to put old stuff that I, that i've done before into that and trying to combine it mm -hmm. but i think that's the best way to 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 learn and that way the the learning process was way faster yeah because you, you just have a shortcut mm -hmm. and did you notice a concrete like a real an actual improvement in the edge and in your let's say trading performance overall yes it's way more diversified so it's 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 way more diversified and it's also an, an improvement in the logic behind it before that, it was just looking what works but i did not understood why it is working mm -hmm. or what's the logic behind it yeah and i think if you want to deeply under, understand something for me personally i want to know why is it yeah of course the market's rising when there are more buyers and sellers blah 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 we know all that stuff but but what's the logic behind the analysis you're doing like yeah if you take an order block or a trend line or anything you're using what is the reason or logic explanation this thing is working yeah so of course yeah mm -hmm. that that helped me a lot nice and uh right now you trade by yourself or you trade with the team I trade with the team, so I okay. support the team. I also trade for myself, but I declined that a lot because mm -hmm. I don't see the biggest potential in there. Yeah. Um, because it is a lot of stress to trade. For, it's not relaxing to trade. Yeah. Like if somebody has traded for six, seven, eight hours a day, even just for four, and when I trade for six hours or more, I go home, I'm, I'm dead. Like I'm just yeah. lying on the sofa. Same. My girlfriend's like, Jonathan, you're like, so is, is something was like no i'm just i'm just done and um sometimes you still need brain capacity to to interact with others have like social experience and yeah so i'm mainly supporting the team in analysis also supporting patrick with uh, his role as portfolio manager mm -hmm. um yeah so i'm mainly doing this and also why should i trade for myself and like 
support others in building investment structures mm -hmm. when I can just invest in the investment structure definitely and support the investment structure. Makes so. sense. Makes a lot Makes of sense. sense. And I do crypto in, in official legal structures. Most often it's difficult to trade crypto. Yeah. So I'm doing this mainly by myself. Like if I trade for myself, I sometimes swing, have swing positions in some mm -hmm. altcoins. I'm doing uh, Bitcoin mining. I'm hedging myself also in, in Bitcoin. I'm mm -hmm. doing stuff like this. Nice. nice. And I'm also still learning a lot. Like a big, a big learning on my to-do list is everything about options. Yeah. I know same. that this space is so big. And I, there's so much I need, still need to learn. So yeah. on my to-do, there's still, if I have free time, why should I trade for two more hours if I can also learn more stuff yeah. that I don't know yet? Definitely. And options is, is also my on my wish list for now. Yes. Yeah, it's a bit more complicated because, you know, you have much more variables to take into account, implied volatility, all the Greeks and everything. But the advantage that it can give you with risk management or with uh, market neutral strategies or volatility strategies, like those things that you simply can't do with, you know, usual or traditional in instruments. So market market neutral strategy is also a good keyword for me. It's like I can trade the whole day. I can just focus on trading and make some money. Mm -hmm. But what am I going to do or what do I want from my life? What do I want to do long term? It's not sitting in front of the screen for six, seven, eight hours a day. Yeah. And I have a limited amount of time. And when I invest that, where can I scale my time fastest? So for me, it's in, in the investment space. So gathering capital, but it takes a lot of time. Like all the calls, all the legal stuff. Mm -hmm. Being able to manage that, also handle the emotions if you manage more capital or if you do analysis where you know it can influence somebody else's decision that's managing capital. Mm -hmm. And also in building, for example, market neutral automated strategies. For me, it makes way more sense to invest time in this. Like educate yourself, but when you've educated yourself, how can you automate or scale that one faster? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, it's like I've spent now a lot of time, I think three years full time. And before that, maybe 20% of my time and just learning the stuff. And now it's for me about scaling it and automating it. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about trading styles because what you just said about, you know, I don't want, uh, you know, at the beginning I chose trading because I didn't want to be the slave of a job anymore. Mm -hmm. But from going to being a slave of a job to being a slave of the charts, it doesn't really change anything, you know? So I'm, I'm starting more and more since I was a scalper before and, I'm, and I still am. I'm starting more and more to appreciate swing trading and long-term position trading. Um, and some of the strategies I've learned from you are also in that, let's say, time frame, trading time frame. Do you do also swing trading? Yes. Are you, are you, do you also scalp and day trade? How is your usual day or trading activity? So I'm completely out of scalping. For me, it's too stressful. Mm -hmm. Like you have to make so many decisions each second. It's very stressful. Yeah. Um, there are some people that are awesome at scalping and for them it's like, playing counter-strike or some some game yeah fabio is one of them fabio is one of them and i've seen him like I've, i was sitting with him like one month ago and in, in some cafe in, in dubai i was like we were trading together and i just saw him in front of the chart like i was like <laughs> fuck this look this looks even even i don't know what he's feeling it looks very stressful <laughs> i'm stressful just by staying yeah, and I, was, I was sitting there and had like two swing positions in, in currencies and he was like what are you doing you i was like trading but you're doing nothing i was like yeah, I did analysis and now I'm looking and after some hours I need to look at it again if the if the trade's still valid, if I need to manage it, but that's it. It's not like in, out, in, out, in, out. Do I go in again? No, maybe not. Maybe yes. So no, um, for me, it's more long-term, like at least intraday swing. Intraday swing, I think it's okay. Mm -hmm. You can get, get some nice profits over there, but the, the most relaxed one is just go to swing trading mm -hmm. or automated stuff. What do you, what do you say it's the best way to swing trade for a person who let's say it's because if if the problems with scalping is that you have to make a lot of decision at the same time i the thing i like about scalping is that you're not falling in love with the trade necessarily like trades are so frequent yes. that you give less of a shit of what's the outcome of a specific trade and my my uh problem with swing trading is constantly checking the position seeing if it's high or if it's low like or 
having enough patience to let it run. How do you like? How is your experience with that, with letting position run? For me, in the beginning, it was way more difficult to let position start, run because the connect, like, the connection to money is way higher. I think the more often you do it, the more relaxed I get with position. For example, I know I have four open positions now during the podcast. I know that I will have them yesterday when I knew that I'm gonna go to Prague today. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't care anymore. I know like there's a stop. I know that there can be slippage. I know if an atomic bomb will go off somewhere, the slippage is gonna be big. But it's part of the game. It's part of the rules. And if I would not be willing to risk it, I would not do it. So yep. calculate the risk before, and then just do it repetitive mm -hmm. over and over again. So that way you get relaxed. How? Me. And another thing about swing trading is exit strategy. Like you have to plan it before. Yes or yes. Or, or are you? flexible with how you let it run i always haven't take have a take profit but it would be better to trail the take profit away when the market comes closer but very often i'm not at the charts because i i'm not always at the screens i'm doing project projects beside like recording this podcast um then it's not possible but if i'm at the charts it's better to for me i just trail or take profit away see like is there still strength is there still power in the market is there is still speed and if there is nothing anymore and i see okay there is no interest in, in trading anymore then i just go out market or trail trail to take profit lower or at least trail the stop loss mm -hmm. afterwards yeah so um i always have a fixed take profit because otherwise i see very often it's un it's unlikely that on the highest point of the market you will be in front of the screens because yeah at the extreme price points the market most of the time is the shortest time yeah. so it's the lowest probability that you're going to be in front of the screen at that point where the market gives you the most profit. Mm -hmm. So I think you should always trade with a take profit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I think it can be that, um, you know, a short-term scalping or that kind of short-term trading is w was propagated so much also because it's a conflict of interest with the brokers because brokers loves when you open a lot of position very frequently so they can have spread commissions and so i think the way it's been spread out so much and the reason why most people most beginners actually goes to day trading and scalping is because it's more uh, convenient for the brokers also so there's been a lot of propaganda around it and and, and interest to promote it and like interest to promote exactly the, the content that is created is for you to generate commissions spreads exactly and so on or the mm, signal room you choose or the copy trading you choose it's gonna open a lot of position very frequently so you're basically a a lot mover more than a trader and so it, th there was definitely a conflict of interest there and also it's much more how do you say adrenalinic you yeah. know it's it's more it's, gambling it's it, it, it's a gambling feeling it is like put some measurement stuff to you and look at your heart rate opening and watching a position it's yeah, gambling definitely in the beginning it's gambling over time you're gonna get more relaxed but yeah. you're still gonna have a feeling when you open and close a trade maybe right. in 10 years i will not have it anymore but i still have it to this day and you have to realize that it can be addictive yeah yeah definitely definitely and i think one more addition to holding swing trades like when you have a swing trade you can have a technical because you say for example oil at five dollars most likely a buy maybe you don't know that it goes negative but even after it's negative and it's back in positive again maybe buy at five dollars um so most of the time even if you don't realize it when you make a technical analysis for a swing trade you see okay the deviation got too big this move is too extended it should come back or you have a fundamental trigger it doesn't matter it can also be society it can be a big crash it can be something you realized in, in your daily life or a friend told you whatever and to hold to a swing trade i think is no problem because for me when i have a swing trade i have a fundamental idea there's a fundamental trigger there's yeah. something that happened or that i got to know i talked with a friend that had insight into logistics and he's telling me oh we have a lot of business to do. And I was like, okay, maybe this is gonna be or show up in the markets a couple of weeks later. Mm -hmm. Or there's a CPI that is way different than expected. I was like, okay, this is an idea that this currency gets strong or weak. And then I look for a technical support. Like, that's the way I... Yeah, for time and the entry, yeah. And as long as my theory is there, 
I see, okay, I have a fundamental trigger because, for example, I have an, uh, a big deviation from the expectation of some fundamental data. And I see a technical reaction of the market. And I open the position. Why should I not hold to the swing trade? Like if yeah. fundamentals change, okay, then maybe I need to go out of the position. Or I never get a technical confirmation. Like yeah. I have a fundamental idea and I see, okay, I think the yens should weaken, but it's just rising, rising, rising. Maybe my fun fundamental analysis is shit. It's it's part yeah, of the game. Yeah, sometimes and maybe good. Sometimes maybe good, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes maybe, maybe shit. shit. <laughs> so um, as long as the fundamental idea is there and the technicals are in line, yeah. use the trend, whatever you want to use to analyze. Um, yeah to stick to it yeah about news trading as you know i'm um i'm trading news often uh, i like to both scalp them or intraday trade them but if uh, especially of course it depends in which part of the business cycle we are because like my favorite way to trade fundamentals in the long term is if we're in especially in the top part or the lower part of the business cycle and there's starting to be data showing that we are inverting the cycle then it's much more probable to have the next trend mm -hmm. at, or at least for the market expectation of the new trend. So if I see that at the end of the day of the release, the candle is bullish, it means that long-term traders have been putting their position and not closing them at the end of the day. So it's not just a speculative move for the news. So the way a candle closes after a day where a news is being released is a huge indicator for the next five, six, 10 daily candles or the new uh, monthly trend or something. So, um, so, so, so definitely, the the daily closure for me it's a really good indication of what is the long term traders doing, uh, except all the speculators of, of of that day. So I think that's. I mean, when you look at the market moves during big big news, news are positive, markets go down. News are negative, markets go up. Maybe they go down as well. Sometimes right, sometimes not right. So um, I think it's because if you just look at spreads and the order books, just open an order book during high news, market makers remove liquidity, you have big spikes, liquidity on both sides, and you can draw liquidity lines, whatever you want to do, just look at the order book. Is there some liquidity? Is there none? And if we have a wide move, is it there long term? Like you say, where is the close at the end of the day? Yeah. Where's like the final auction? Because that's, for example, also a lot of people don't know. When you're a big fund, and you want to buy a position in a stock or whatever. Or you are even an ETF. You have like AGBs. I don't know. It's like the legal papers that describe the product you offer. Mm -hmm. Even an ETF has that. Where it describes what is the underlying product, for example. Or a big fund that has a sell order or wants to get out or in of a position. Sometimes there's not enough liquidity over the day. Because if they would like buy or sell all the positions they want to have they would move the market too strong. So in the last 15, 20, 30 minutes of the market, there's like the final market auction where the big players, that's why you see a lot of volume in the end session, yeah. move their position. So it's it's interesting to have a look what happens at the end of the day. Yeah, definitely. When, when, when the big players go to the last fight, some want to buy, some want to sell. Yes, yes. What are, what, are, what are they doing? Was the move spike just a big spike somewhere because no market maker was there and then like, some guy mm -hmm. tried to manipulate in, in one direction or was it like a fundamental real move where people really want to get in or out of a position yeah yeah definitely um also there's um because i've talked with a, a very expert italian trader uh, about order flow and market mechanics and he was explaining me about um uh market to close or or order to market close order something like this where it, like it's a type of order that has to be closed by the end of the day and there's a lot of algorithms that use these kind of uh, of things and they have to be closed. Uh, they st start being closed after like 10 minutes before market closing mm -hmm. or they can't be open anymore 10 minutes uh, before after clo uh, 10 minutes before after closing. Uh, so, so yeah, there's a, there's a huge spike in volume at that point of the day and market make like it's a, it's a feast for market makers. Yeah. And it's also fund exchanging stuff. Like yes. Sometimes a fund is only allowed to invest in, in, in the European markets but they maybe want to buy a stock in the Indian market. So they just swap yes. stocks with yes. another fund in India, for mm -hmm. example. 
Yeah. So there's there's a lot of stuff going on. Mm-hmm. The final. Do you use order flow for your confirmation entries? And if you use order flow, what what advantages do you think it, it provides? I was when I learning from Patrick and his team. I was because they were using it, so I was studying it. Um, I was using it at the beginning when I was more into short-term day trading and less into swing trading. In swing trading, for me, there's no real big benefit for it. It's yeah. it's like too many information. Reduce it, make it simple. In swing trading, in day trading, I would definitely use it. Order book as well as a footprint. Um, so I was using it. I'm not using it anymore because I'm re- trying to reduce my screen time and looking at uh, order flow and order book is not mm-hmm. part yeah, of that. Definitely. What do you think about Lambo Gurus? Nice. Like it. Like it. Love like them. it. Like it. No, I think um, I also love cars. Um, but for me, I still love them, but they lose interest when you drove them sometimes. For example, in our office, we had a GT4, a Porsche GT4. In the beginning, it was like, oh, yeah, I'm so hyped to drive it the first time. Then sometimes you drive it and then you realize. It's it's not that fun anymore. <laughs> like in the beginning, it's a big dream, and then the the experience got less and less. And I think if you interview people that reached all that stuff, like I'm not at the point where I can buy five Bentleys and two Lambos. But even if you talk to guys that are able to buy all the stuff, they're gonna tell you it's but not it gonna make matter. you happy. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It does not. I, I mean, it triggers. Yeah, but that's, it's not gonna question. make you happy. Yeah, it's, yeah, what's what's gonna make you happy is go on some holiday with five friends somewhere nowhere, or just making a spontaneous trip to Prague yeah. and and meet some friends. Or, I guess my I guess my question was more: uh, What do you think about promoting or using lifestyle to promote trading services? And it's, it's the most common use because greed. People are triggered by greed. People are triggered by I made two hundred percent this year. Nobody of those people asks what's the risk that's on the opposite side of it. How much did you risk to make 100, 200%? Um, but it's an important question to ask. How high was the risk of a drawdown? Yeah. And how high was the risk for you buying the Dumbo? So yeah. did you, ma- you really made it by trading or was the risk I put uh, $500 in some ad spend and then I rented for $1,000 a, a, a Lumbo for one day and that was my risk and the return was I made like 200K from coaching? Well, yeah, it's it's an important question to ask. So I think I think it's valid that people show off that like it. There are people that that are happy with buying nice yeah. watches, nice cars. I think there's nothing wrong with it. I think it's wrong if it's the only way you promote yourself. Yeah. What do you think? Like, if if you were to evaluate buying a course from someone or a coaching for from someone, what would be the the indication you suggest looking at the Lambo or I don't know, a broker statement. I mean, you know? I mean, for me, for me, it was a championship and broker statements, um, yeah. and also the way that the other people act. Like, are they arrogant or are they like just normal humans? I mean, most mm. people are, but for me, those guys were people that were like not touchable, but they were like on the same level. They were yeah. like like just normal humans and not like the arrogant high-nosed people working pricks yeah pricks nose up in the air walking through life yeah um, so that that's for me like just testified statements like a championship like a track record yeah and yeah. if there's a lumbo as well it's nice but yeah. it's, it's not yeah, the main focus yes, i would yes. i personally would focus on yeah it shouldn't be definitely i think that um you know because uh you know if overall you you are a legitimate trader and you show off some of your wealth or your lifestyle i don't think it's a problem it can motivate people but at the same time i think it can be the wrong kind of motivation because greed in trading can be like as long as greed is the thing that it's keeping you in the right path and like fuck i want that lambo i want that lifestyle i want that life so i'm gonna keep doing my process and respecting risk management then it's it's good but i think for 95% 95% of people greed is fucking up their trading instead yes. so I think be- because trading is one of the few professions where you have to focus on the process and not on the results if you want to have results someone who is triggering you with results is not making you a favor at all so I I, I, I personally never show my lifestyle or never show or you know I, I don't think that 
showing off your lifestyle or showing off your profits or showing off your trades on social media is doing your community any favor. It's more like a like self masturbation, you know, like a ego um, ego boost. But you're not doing really a favor to the traders, even if even if you're legit. Uh, then of course there's the whole rest of the of the spectrum, which is complete scammers that just uh, rent a Lambo for a day or you know. Um, so yes, it's a. Uh, the, the the educational trading guru's word is a bit uh, is a bit controversial. And I think I think it's also about the perspective. Like, what are the people think they're gonna get when they go into trading? Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna make two hundred percent each year. Yeah, can do that, but there's a lot of work in it, and the path there is not gonna be clean. Like everybody wants an equity curve that's just going straight up. Yeah, most likely not a, a vertical one. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Most most likely not gonna happen. Yeah. What do you think it's a good percent, a, a good return for a retail trader? 50 to 100 percent. From 50 to 100? Yes, something between 50 and 200 percent of somebody's trading full time. Yeah. With an average risk of? 20, maximum 30 percent. Drawdown, yes. ma- maximum drawdown. Yes. Yeah. So risk per trade, and, well, it depends on, on, the, on the kind of trading for sure. Yeah. And also, how much capital do you need to live from trading? I think... There is no universal answer to this. You need to make clear what are your expenses. What do you expect from life? Do you want to buy a Lambo? Most likely you need a lot of money. Um, or do you eat a lot of food in restaurants, fancy restaurants, whatever? Yeah. Everybody needs to define and list their expenses. What are my expenses over the previous 12 months, 14 months? Yeah. And then you should at least look, whatever, what have I made from trading the past months or for my strategy? And then at least double it mm-hmm. before you go full time it because mm-hmm. you're gonna have drawdowns. You're gonna have phases where it's not running good, or markets just silent over the summer or whatever. Yeah, and those periods are gonna be hard if you don't have like some money saved. Definitely. Um, what do you think about prop firms then? Do you think they're a good way for people to capitalize or to get? I funded? think th- I think they're nice. They're a nice op- opportunity. Um, they trigger a lot of greed. And people need to realize that when they have a 100k account and they can have a drawdown of 10k, mm-hmm. they don't have a 100k account, yeah. <laughs> they have a 10k account. Yeah. They can just take a 10k account by themselves and crash it to zero or, or adjust the risk. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think prop firms in general are nice. I think the rules sometimes are very, very harsh. I don't know. I'm not deep into into the prop firm space. So what are the rules? But I, a couple of years ago... Um, I had a look at how is it called? I think my forex funds, mm-hmm. and they were like you had two phases, and then you had like x days you need to trade, and then the drawdown was trailing on the equity and not on the balance. I think there are some rules that are difficult, and if you have a strategy that's working, I think you need to adapt the strategy to the rules of the prop firm. Yeah, because yeah, otherwise, definitely. I think in the long run you're gonna lose it. Yeah, yeah, but I think I think in general they're good if they're still there yeah <laughs> i mean if they're a book b book whatever i would not care as long as they pay out the money like as, if, as if enough there's... people use it everybody is deciding to play this game yeah even the game of prop firms yeah yeah yeah. and if the prop firm is really placing your orders or not it's their business yeah the point like i think the bigger the prop firm the better because you know uh, a prop firm as a business model can only be profitable it's only if it keeps selling new challenges first of all and if it finds a way to identify profitable traders with enough data to be statistically accurate on that trader and then mirror those traders and hedge those trades because otherwise it's not going to be solvent in in, in the long term and the point of what, why most uh, prop firms are failing right now is because they don't have a model, an algorithm to identify risky traders versus... And they're too small. The cash flow incoming from failed challenges in the beginning is too small and you cannot place every order of people exactly. buying challenges on the real market. And the, and the, pro, and the, net, the other problem is for, for a while it has been that uh, people were using HFT bots with latency arbitrage yeah. to pass challenges and then would take the account and flip it. Yeah. So the risk of prop firms got extremely high on that. Plus people were uh, hedging each other with uh, some prop from like they would pass two challenges with the bots and then flipping them like one against each other. So how can you control that risk? Like 
Sometimes it's profitable, sometimes it's not. So it's uh, like these people have been milking this kind of bug in the leverage system of prop firms. And now prop firms are being in, insolvent. Mm. Like so many prop firms, like uh, my, my Forex funds was one, True Forex funds, uh, the fund, the trader, like so many. My Forex fund is gone? It's gone. It's completely oh, gone. Crazy. Yeah. Um, I think in the last period and in the next period as well, more are gonna are gonna start failing because of this uh, bug in the leverage system that some that some traders are leveraging. So it's uh, I think it's a good it's a good way to capitalize. But if there's if they are too easy to pass, it's much more likely than they're gonna fail. Yeah, like, I think I think there's like a similarity in the crypto space. A lot of people in the crypto space discuss which one is the best stablecoin. Which one is most regulated? Which one is most liquid? Which will gonna? Which one will stay there forever? Yeah, and most people criticize USDT, so Tether. Uh, it's the one biggest market capitalization, and mm-hmm. it's the longest time in the game. People are like ah oh, no, but Circle is better, better because it's more regulated. Yes, FTX was more regulated than Binance or whatever, and it's still gone. Yeah. And I think a big question is how many people are using this space because yes there are a lot of scams out there but if you have a running system and it's growing and more people are using it why should you shut down the scam just continue running it and using it as a cash cow Mm -hmm. if usd if tether is backed or not we don't know but it's the biggest one it's the longest time in the market and they're earning a lot of money with like i think 50 employees every month Mm -hmm. uh, every year so why should they not continue to do it and it's it's the same it's the same for me with with prop firms Mm -hmm. but the big difficulty for me is that me and i think patrick as well i don't think so i know it is like we have we more like less high hit rate but higher risk Mm towards most people like high hit rates they want to be right all the time Um, we prefer another trading style so and that's difficult with prop firms because yeah you have a lot of them i think we had a where the trading stop is on the equity and not on the balance. And if you have a low hit rate, difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, about, uh, let's move into the um, uh, more trendy things. Like we're talking about prop firms, which is definitely one of them. Um, about uh, market mechanics. There's been a lot of talking about the algorithm and about this. Um, the algorithm? The algorithm. You know, the the algorithm that controls every single movement of the markets. Uh-huh. This interbank price delivery algorithm. So Patrick pressing red and green buttons. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, so what do you think? Do you think there is an actual interbank algorithms that is controlling the market no. all the time? No. I think there there are powerful algorithms that control special situations. Of course there are. I mean, a lot of it is just providing liquidity. And yes, there are algorithms, but I don't think that there is like one algorithm controlling all the markets. Maybe there are some algorithms that are the reason for main moves in an asset, but maybe specialized for one asset. Assets are performing too different. Yes. Like if you just analyze reversion trend, just behaviors of assets, at what time do they move? How do they move? Yeah. Just in a statistical way. It cannot be one algorithm because they move different. Yeah. So it Definitely. at least has to be one, two, three, four, five. Yes. No, so and I also, think so. I think there's a the variety of market participant is so huge that even saying that you know there's this interbank algorithm controlling the market yeah but which banks yeah it's it makes no sense the like banks are competitors yeah they are fighting each other in the market they're not deciding all together hey let's move the market this they're like what like what no, nobody, it doesn't make any nobody, sense nobody would profit yeah yeah Often. no one would profit definitely yeah, yeah. that that's that's also true by the way like let, let me get deep into that because if they would all do the same thing they no one would profit so Definitely. That, that is so fucking stupid. Uh, let's move to the next question. Do you think that banks hunt for retail stop losses? No. Hmm. Um, you can use the data of retail stop losses. Like there are platforms where you can buy data and where retail put their stop losses. Or if you just look at a, lo- at a lot of retail stuff, you realize how retail puts their stop loss above a high, below a high, and so on. And if most of them lose money, do the opposite. Um, liquidity of retail I think is 1 to 3% mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. difficult to measure because you don't know how much is executed in the real markets and so on. I mean, it is part of liquidity, but a bank would not think, I'm not going to sell this now because there's a retail liquidity. Yeah, you know, like half a percent higher. So we're <laughs> going to move it there, which costs us billions to get like, I don't know, 100 billions of retail liquidity above some high. And then we're going to use this to short it. I mean, the market's general about liquidity. So if you're a big player, of course, you're going to look where where is liquidity, but they're way bigger players. Yeah. Just look at funds. Like funds are most likely better liquidity than some retail traders definitely on different platforms so yeah and, and, think, also, yes. and also most most retail traders are trading cfds guys so it's like most are against their broker yeah. so yeah uh, so they are part of the liquidity but everybody else is as well my stop losses as well so i'm definitely. i'm i'm also uh liquidity to somebody when i get when i get triggered a stop yeah. loss yes and also you can be the liquidity of another retail yes so it's like whatever okay What's your opinion on, let's say, trading versus investing? Which one is better or pros and cons? Trading is better to make high performance. Investing is better to be relaxed and enjoy life. Um, I think in the beginning, if you don't have somebody depending on you, trade. Take high risks. There's nothing wrong with it. Like if you're a student, if you're in school, whatever, or you just got your job, you graduated, you have a job, and no family, trade, make gains. And I think the more capital you gain, the more you should go into investing because then you have time for other stuff that really makes you happy in life. At the beginning, trading is exciting. After one, two, three years, it's gonna get boring. It's repetitive. Mm-hmm. People always think, oh, it's so fancy. Press red and green buttons. It's boring, it's repetitive, it's yeah. simple. It's it's simple. Like it's a simple way to earn money when you when you, when you master it. But Definitely. I think trading is the hardest way to make easy money. Yeah. Like if I would, if I find a person that's making consistent gains, which we are working on, investment products and so on, why should I do it myself? Even if I get 10% less, I just find a job. I've, I search for something else to earn money. Yeah. Why should I, for 10% extra a year, why should I sit in front of the screen every day for four hours? Yeah, definitely. Find don't some trade guys <laughs> trade that, like, definitely like in the beginning and master it and yeah. I love it and for me it's still fun like sometimes for example a month ago I was in Africa with some friends it was nice and I think I was not being away at the charts for four years there was no week where I was not looking at the charts mm-hmm. for more than one two days and there in Africa the internet was just so fucked up it was not possible and then I was there with like four friends from, from, from my school time and we had a good time and the internet was fucked up so I was not having a look at the charts for two weeks. It was nice. But at the end I was missing it. Mm. You know, and I had like the craving to do again. Yeah, like what, what's going on in the world? <laughs> what is happening with the currencies? What is happening yeah. with the stock market? But yeah, it, it just gets boring at sometimes. Mm-hmm. Do you track your trading? If yes, how? And which one are the best metrics that a trader should track on their performance? Yes, I do track. Um, the more you do it or the longer you do it, the less I do it. I still take screenshots because it's for me easy to do. It's not typing numbers. At the beginning, I did Excel sheets. Then there are some journaling softwares. But I don't think that it was like the best journaling software that I found yet. Um I just try different ones and then in the end I stick to screenshots and nowadays I still take a screenshot before I enter trade after I enter trade I try to implement most information of my thinking process in the chart um, for example if I have a fundamental idea yeah. I have the fundamental news event on my chart if I take sentiment for example in, into consideration I have this on my chart if I use market profile volume profile um, I have this on my chart and I just press like three keys and the mm-hmm. screenshot is saved. Yeah. And at the end of the week, I always have a slot of one or two hours at the weekend where I go through all of these. Like mm-hmm. also in the morning when I did day trades yesterday, before I start trading for the day, I go through the sc- screenshots and trades of yesterday to see what have I done yesterday, what was my idea, change something, direction, whatever. Mm-hmm. Have I done some mistakes? Yeah. And yeah. Which uh, for you are the most important metrics in the evaluation of the performance of a trader? Um, hit rate definitely the hit rate to know yeah um, then assets which assets perform good which assets perform 
bad mm -hmm. as it's behaved different and your gut feeling can be expressed in this like maybe you have a feeling for one asset and not for another just mm -hmm. cut out the asset profit factor and average risk to reward and also time of profitable and not profitable trades mm -hmm. nice do you also use when you're evaluating strategies at the um, like ratios like sharpie ratio or sortino ratio or these kind of things um i was analyzing at the beginning i'm not doing it anymore yeah or do you also work with algorithms or are you uh, also in the systematic trading? Yes, I love it. I think it's one of my biggest passions mm -hmm. now because I see the biggest potential in there. You can reach a lot when you have a group of discretionary traders, but it's still going to be discretionary. It's dependent on a person. It's dependent on the experience of one person. If Patrick has an accident tomorrow, where is his experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, stick to some tree and a car that's it um, and also there's a limit of how many markets you can observe Yeah, I think discretionary trading is, is in swing trading for example it's good for special situations Yeah, you have like something like the oil crash or you have like a, a bubble forming where you say okay I'm trying to short stocks now or you have the COVID crash where you say okay now it's a very cheap opportunity to buy stocks for stuff like this discretionary trading is very good for the daily average movements, I think algorithmic is, is, is better if you want to diversify. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. algorithmic, you can analyze and build strategies for markets. And yes, markets are changing. I did not believe it in the beginning. I was like, why should they change? They always behave the same. No, they're not. They're really changing. So you also need to adapt algorithms. But you can observe a lot of markets. Like we, we, have, a, we have a friend, colleague um, we got to know. Um, very well he's also close in South Germany to us and we're working closely with him and he's very very good in all the algorithm stuff we have up running now I think 100 different strategies so 100 individual strategies trading 300 assets all over the globe hmm. like stocks currencies bonds volatility futures yeah. all of this stuff you maybe need a team of 10 20 really good traders to do this yeah definitely and there we are one developer <laughs> two, two people <laughs> and one developer now i mean yeah. we're growing to a second developer because also in the developing side you want to have a backup but it's way easier to scale it and you're way more diversified you have you have you have less emotions in it and if you manage big capital emotion is a is going to get a big big topic definitely so yeah for me it's 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 the future and it's, it's awesome all, always good to diversify so there's i don't like it that very often in the internet there's black and white mix it like there's good stuff in investment where you just invest in the S&P 500 or ETFs or whatever investing yeah. for you is there's positives and negatives about trading we expressed them previous yeah. in the podcast there's positive and negative thing about algorithmic trading so why not do all of it like just mix it and there are different phases of your life or the position where you are how much knowledge you have what are you going to do so if you have no knowledge, just do basic investment. Don't trade because most likely you're going to lose your money. If you have no clue about trading, I think automating can be accomplished, but it's going to be way more difficult if you have a little bit of clue about trading. So I think it's you have to think about where are you, what's your knowledge, what's your risk appetite, and then decide on that where you invest your time. 100% agree. 100% agree on diversification. Of course, at the end of the day, you can risk only as much so diversifying doesn't mean that you're going to make more profit necessarily but it means that the equity line is going to be smoother in a way you know so so definitely i would i would prefer to make less profit and be more diversified like for example if you guys uh, if fabio would would build an investment structure i would invest in it i would take part of my capital and put it there yeah if he makes more or less profit than i do i don't know I can try to calculate how did he perform the previous year, does he a statement, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know how much he's, he's going to make. But even at the end of the year, if I'm going to make less or even I lost money, it's okay because it's part of it. It's not full exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's diversified. So I think I think there's a big, big profit then. Definitely.